the dream Harry Way has run and down uh, August something 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 in Gaelic that translates to and welcome to spooky house and <laughs> uh, even though I still do the bulk of my videos in English only I still gotta um, show that I'm learning I'm learning new things at my uh, advancing age, but, um, hi! There's a kitty here. So, this is at least the fourth time I've tried filming this. So, um, about what it was like being a goth in high school at the exact time of the Columbine High Massacre. Okay, so first some quick facts about the time I was in high school. Uh, so, uh, I was in high school in the late 90s. While I am very close to Angela Benedict in age, uh, we're not the same age, and if you have been paying attention long enough and are good at maths, you can probably figure out how old I was <laughs> in 1999, though I do still reserve the right to mess with people about how old I actually am, because why the hell not? Um, we just have good skin in my family, especially on my dad's side. But that's another story for another time. So, like almost every high school, in the United States especially, though... I'm under the impression that something very similar goes on in Canada, um, the UK, Australia, Ireland, and New Zealand, all of that, uh, basically, especially in the English-speaking countries, and probably most other, if not all other countries. Um, like nearly every other high school in the US especially, uh, our school had this social hierarchy. Now, now, I'm going to be talking about, uh, for the most part, the school where I attended most of my high school. Now, I have mentioned before that I, uh, my father moved us to uh, my stepmother's small, literally acre and a half uh, chicken farm outside Adrian, Michigan. We were smack dab between Adrian and Tecumseh, Michigan, in Lenawee County, and... I went to one of those high schools. There were literally two high schools that I could have attended, and I went to one of them. So, because some people want at least some semblance of a private life. So, um, uh, where was I going with this? So, like just about all other high schools in the U.S., we had the social hierarchy. You know, you had your, um, you had your, like, prom queen, um, student council, athletes, and all of that. And then you had this huge in-between of people who were fairly average, you know, they weren't the, uh, they weren't the most popular athletes, though they may have taken, um, a, a mid or lower tier sport. <laughs> like swim team, uh, and, you know, they weren't especially, uh, nerdy and all of that, and they tended to at least stand up, you know, if not outright stand up for, at least have generally positive thoughts about the high, the high rung, um, tier of the high school social hierarchy. And then at the bottom, you had your nerd geek dork freaks. And <laughs> the nerd geek dork freaks are, uh, now a lot of people will use nerd geek dork, um, very generally interchangeably, though I will link to, I believe it's wisegeek.com. And there is a generally accepted differentiation between the three. So nerds, are your kids, who later become adults, who are more academically and intellectually minded in their um, high school uh, activities and later in their adult life. So these are the people who will pursue a career in science just for the sake of it. Um, 
they are the they are the kids who are like members of the mathletes and um, chess club and all of that. Not necessarily because they want it to look good on a college application, though that is definitely a bonus uh, for their pursuits, but uh, because they genuinely enjoy academics and um, and intellectual pursuits. Basically, every career academic was indeed a high school nerd, and this law is immutable. Um, most university professors were high school nerds, especially if they're um, if if they're teaching in a field that generally you can only find careers in that field by teaching it. So, <laughs> uh, so so yeah, th those were those uh, the nerds. Uh, the geeks are those who are not necessarily nerdy, though there is often an overlap, but who um, pursue interests that are considered generally immature for anybody older than, say, junior high, or I guess they're calling it middle school now. So if you are into high fantasy, um, beyond just the absolute most popular titles like Lord of the Rings, though until Peter Jackson's blockbuster hits with the, with the films, um, and geeks were the reason Tolkien stayed in print for 50 some years. So, <laughs> so yeah, like the high fantasy and science fiction genres, um, the, the, all those conventions, those are populated by largely geeks. Geeks have kept the science fiction and high fantasy genres, especially the convention circuit in business for, for those of you unaware well over the last 40 years. Seriously, these have been going on far longer than you care to imagine. Uh, people who are into comic books well after, well after middle school are generally geeks. Uh, not necessarily always. I mean, graphic novels are becoming fairly mainstreamed lately, so, um, you know, especially the whole, like, comic book movie, um, you know, superhero, especially, um, film, uh, genres becoming fairly mainstream and respectable, but as with many things, this is probably going to cycle in another, I don't know, number of years, and it's probably going to be regarded as generally a geeky interest again, and then 20 years after, and then after 20 years of that, after all, like, superhero um, films were a big thing in the 70s. Anybody else who was a teenager in the 90s remember L Lois and Clark? I sure as hell do. This is the reason Dean Cain had a career for a bit, and now, I don't know, he's, he's kind of jerking off our ignoring Orange in Chief, but, uh, uh, but, um, but yeah, so geeks are the ones who, you know, keep the um, Dungeons and Dragons, um, Wizards of the Coast in money. Uh, they're the ones who will continue going to superhero movies even after it has long stopped being a uh, mass media mainstream fad. Uh, they're the ones who keep Tolkien's survivors um, in well into the billions of dollars um, American money, because... Tolkien was British, wasn't he? Yes, he was. Uh, dorks are not necessarily geeks or nerds, but are regarded as generally just socially awkward, and and th that is... Um, I see dork falling into a little bit of disuse just because more is known about the autism spectrum disorders lately, and so we don't necessarily see dork outside of self-application lately anymore, but dorks are generally regarded as just vaguely socially awkward, though not necessarily with a uh, neurodivergence to explain that. Um, and dorks tend to overlap with geeks and nerds, though not necessarily. Um, then freaks, depending on the size of your high school, um, will just be kind of the general all-purpose term for goths, punks, hippies, 
uh, hippies are still around to some extent. Um, LGBT kids, uh, especially during, depending on the size of your high school, so especially in most rural high schools, um, especially in a community, even though it's in southeast Michigan, like mine was, has a odd collection of Christian conservatives. Oh, God, that's, that's a story and a half on its own, isn't it? Um, so, yeah, your, uh, your gay kids, your goth kids, punk kids, including various offshoots of punk, um, your hippies. hippies. I'm kind of using this generally to include um, all sorts of um, activism, not necessarily just, like, you know, the crunchy granola sorts who, you know, like, I don't know, like, play hacky sack and listen to fish. Got uh, Revival hippies were a huge thing in the 90s, and I think a lot of people have forgotten that, like, seriously. It was, it was, it was huge. Um, so, th these, these were all tended to be lumped in with the freaks. Uh, if you've seen the, uh, the Freaks and Geeks, uh, TV show, that's actually, like, a fairly accurate depiction of... Even in the 90s, even though the show was set in the very early... I think it was, like, set in, like, 1980 or 81, but... Um, but that's actually a fairly accurate um, depiction of how the, you know, nerd dork geeks and freaks sort of overlapped, not necessarily in interests, but in... Um, in how we socialized with each other and were, and, and tended to just generally be um, on the bottom rungs of our high school's social hierarchy ladder. And that's kind of important to my story because at my high school, like I said, it was the, the Nerd Geek Dork Freak um, collection, collective, uh, the Nerd Geek Dork Freaks, we all shared one table at my high school, and in fact, on April 21st, uh, it was the, like, the geeks at my high school, they were the ones who treated, like, all five of my high school's goth kids, they, they were the only ones who didn't treat us any differently come April 21st, but I'll get to that in a bit, I'm, uh. Ah, now on to, uh, part two of this nonsense. Now, this is the part where I've got a lot of notes that I shall be referring to. This is the part where we just have a lot of plain facts about the Columbine High Massacre from Littleton, Colorado, which occurred on the 20th of April, 1999. And if, for some reason, you find any of these facts in doubt, I have sourced the hell out of this. So, let's continue. Massacre at Columbine High School was in Littleton, Colorado at Columbine High School uh, on the 20th of April, 1999, so... I forget the exact time of the day, but the, uh, but the shooting took place over the course of just under an hour. Uh, most sources I have found cite 50 minutes. Um, a couple have said 55 minutes. So the shooters were one, uh, Eric Harris, aged 18, Dylan Klebold, aged 17. Uh, at this point, it seems unfair to refer to them as boys, but more accurately as young men. Uh, contrary to common belief, which apparently is still being spouted by a lot of people, in spite of this being debunked for a good decade now since the FBI files have become declassified, uh, the date of April 20th was little more than a happy coincidence to them that it coincided with the birth date of Adolf Hitler. Uh, while Harris in particular had kind of an edgelordy fascination with Hitler, uh, his, his the date he chose had everything gone his way, though in many ways it didn't, and I'll explain that. So the date he personally chose was the 19th, which, if you check your... 
uh, Wikipedia at the very least. This was also the anniversary date of the Oklahoma City bombing enacted by one Timothy McVeigh, and also uh, one of the dates associated with the siege on the Branch Davidian compound in Waco, Texas. The, uh, the Branch Davidians being a cult headed by one David Koresh, cult leader. Uh, so, yeah, he wanted this to coincide with that with those anniversaries, not Adolf Hitler. <laughs> Trust me, I have sourced this, and I'm, yeah, I'm I'm sure, hun, I'm sure you were working for a record label at the time, but that don't mean anything. Your label didn't keep records for the FBI, hun. Speaking of things that did not go their way. Uh, they also planned not a mere school shooting that would leave 14 fatalities. I want to say 14, um, one of whom died later in hospital, 13 of whom uh, died on the scene. So, uh, speaking of things that did not go their way, uh, they did not plan for a mere Mir, which at the time was the deadliest, but, you know, they did not plan for a mere school shooting. They wanted the, uh, they wanted to have a bombing, uh, that would, as per Klebold's journals, would have caused the most deaths in U.S. history. So, among, so how did they plan to enact this? They, well, first off, uh, they had no idea how to wire a bomb, and I'm sure the survivors are very grateful for that, because they had planted a couple of bombs in the library, which was over the cafeteria. Uh, their hopes was that the bombs would go off and cave in the floor from the library through the uh, ceiling of the cafeteria. They then hoped that any... Uh, survivors that would flee from the school at that point uh, would be um, coming through the main exit and uh, wherein the two of them would just be blaring off their guns and should they have survived, which they didn't expect to, but they did have a backup plan in case they survived, uh, that they would then run their car, and I forget whose car they were taking, but and again, that is one thing, that is another thing that I did not make a clear note of. Uh, but they, uh, they then hoped that if they had managed to survive, that they would then run their car, which they loaded up with petrol bomb, uh, into any emergency vehicles that were arriving on the scene. So they hoped to kill not as the entire um, human population within the school at the time, uh, of both um, students and faculty, so teachers, custodians, etc., etc., um, as well as themselves, but also any emergency um, technicians, including ambulance drivers, police, etc., 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 who would have arrived on the scene. So, yeah, they, they, they planned something epic of massive proportions. They, they wanted this to... Uh, to, at the time, uh, dethrone the uh, Oklahoma City bombing from the uh, most fatalities um, committed by a U.S. citizen against other U.S. citizens, and all of that. So, uh, now for some additional debunking. Uh, in spite of common beliefs that Klebold and Harris... Uh, targeted jocks and preps, as was the common parlance of 1990s high schools. In spite of common beliefs that uh, Klebold and Harris uh, targeted those who uh, uh, quote-unquote bullied them, they did not. They, in fact, uh, in fact, uh, the FBI um, Agents interviewed by David Cullen for his book. I have included uh, an affiliate link in the description box below. So, if you want to buy it fr from uh, from that particular link, I'll get a tiny commission, but eh, it's something. Uh, so, yeah, uh, the uh, the the agents interviewed by David Cullen have concluded that Klebold and Harris were actually 
moderately popular. They were not, they were nowhere. As I explained in the little quick rundown of social hierarchies in practically every high school in the U.S., as well as the English sphere as I know it, you know, you've got your, you've got your athletes and other popular kids, so like student council, uh, homecoming queens and all of that horseshit. Then you've got a nice, huge uh, mid-tier of people who are well-liked enough that they are completely off the radar, uh, you know, for being uh, bullied or anything. Uh, they generally are not. I mean, yeah, you're probably going to have some personality clashes and all of that, but they they generally tend to side with the popular kids who, um, uh, if we actually look at the psychological studies of bullies, bullies tend to be in this tier. And then at the bottom rungs of the high school social hierarchies, you've got your nerd geek dark freaks. Ah, which would include goths, punks, hippies, etc. Um, gay kids. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, they, they did not target the school bullies. If anything, Eric Harris, especially himself, was a mid-tier aspiring bully. Uh, in fact, there, the, uh, the, the evidence that the, uh, the, the Littleton, um, law enforcement in, uh, in that part of Colorado that, uh, uh, I had the county somewhere in here. I think it was the county sheriff that handled that for the most part. But, uh, so the, uh, the law enforcement that addressed Littleton, Colorado ignored practically every warning sign, which included, uh, Eric Harris making threats against other students, especially this one who, with his parents, reported Eric Harris to the police. Excuse me, hon. Nope, nope, it is not your butt show. And, of course, the uh, police at the time were just like, Oh, well, you know, boys be boys. Yeah, boys be boys. You know how boys get. Yep, boys be boys. Don't have to worry about this. Uh, so, uh, so, yeah, uh, <laughs> obviously, they, they were not targets of bullies. They were targeting others for bullying. So, think about that uh, before you go spreading more lies about the Columbine Massacre. Uh, furthermore, in spite of the Christian fanfiction by Casey Bernal's parents, the two absolutely did not target Christian students. This is something I often see still going around, even for people who otherwise know better. So, uh, so yeah, uh, in fact, Klebold let Valine Schnur, S-E-H-N-U-R-R, -R, uh, who told him she was Christian, uh, when asked, when he asked this of her, he let her crawl away. So if they were targeting any religious group at the school, if they were targeting anybody of any one particular social group, they were being very inconsistent about it. So, uh, furthermore, one thing that a lot of... Hi, cat. <clears throat> One thing that a lot of people still get wrong to this day uh, is the issue of the quote-unquote trench coat mafia. So the trench coat mafia was not at all a part of Klebold and Harris's social group. Uh, but more importantly, what was the trench coat mafia? The trench coat mafia was a... It was basically a nerd geek dork freak group. Seriously. Uh, the trench coat mafia was a very loosely associated clique at Columbine High School, and it was named such because a couple of the upperclassmen at the time the clique existed uh, did choose to wear trench coats as a way of standing out. And more to the fact, uh, the trench coat mafia was largely graduated by the end of the 1998 school year, and those who stuck around didn't really do the trench coat thing. Uh, while a couple um, kids associated with the trench coat mafia were goths, not all of them were, as I said. The trench coat mafia seems to be just the 
local, very short-lived from approximately 1993-94 school year to the 97-98 school year. It seems to be the uh, uh, Columbine High School's little nerd geek dork freak group. Uh, in fact, we can take it from classmate Nick, who was interviewed by one of the more responsible news agents at the time with regards to not only the um, massacre itself, but also the clique associations of Klebold and Harris, which was MTV News. I, 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 I wish I was making that up. I really do. Uh, classmate of their of uh, Cleveland Harris, who was identified by MTV News simply as Nick, said uh, they didn't really get into the goth thing, that is, they being Cleveland and Harris. Uh, that's something the media has created, and that's kind of aggravated me. This whole trench coat mafia thing's been blown out of proportion. Yes, proportion. All it is is a group of kids who felt a little outcast and started wearing trench coats. It's not a huge gang. It's not a community problem. After last year, which would be 98, when a lot of those people who were in it graduated, it kind of died out, and they simply kind of stopped wearing trench coats, actually. It's not really gothic. So I wanted to... I left off at where we were... Uh, I, I had just explained the, uh, the whole trench coat mafia thing. So, uh, the next part I wanted to say is, where did all of this confusion come from? Uh, since Klebold and Harris, hi, Cat, thank you. Yes, we all see your butt. Uh, so, since Klebold and Harris were not at all associated with the trench coat mafia, they're like, th these, these kids were not part of their social group of friends. Um... Where did all of this confusion come from? A lot of people say, well, you know, there's smoke, there's fire. Hi! There's smoke, there's fire. We're, you had to come from somewhere. Well, yeah and no. Uh, the thing that made the Columbine Massacre uh, just uncharted territory at the time was, um, was a few things. And one of those um, would be that this was in close proximity to Denver, a major U.S. city that had representatives from most, if not all, major news outlets in the country. And so people were on the scene, some, some of them even before EMTs arrived, or so said some of the stuff I've read. The news was on the scene pretty much right away. Um, uh, news and emergency um, personnel, such as you know, police, ambulances, all of that, uh, they were pretty much right on the scene before it even you know, before the shooting even ended. So again, like I said, the news were right there, right in the thick of it before the shooting had even ended. So you know, amongst the emergency personnel who arrived on the scene, we also had the Jefferson County Sheriff and. Uh, one of his deputies, at least. And I can't remember, though, the little link repository in the description box uh, will at least point you to an article, at least one of them, uh, which will say whether or not it was uh, the sheriff or one of his deputies. And so, uh, so of course, you know, you have, um, you have news reporters and, um, and other right there on the scene, uh, demanding answers. You also have, like, parents and, uh, and teachers and friends of victims, uh, you know, both young, you know, both, both students and faculty, like, all, you know, demanding to know what the hell is going on before, before it's even over with. And straight up, the, the, the sheriff's department just straight up made shit up. Like, there, there's, there's no way around it. He just straight up made shit up right there on the spot because people were upset and angry and curious and they wanted answers. They demanded answers. 
Um, the, uh, the, the news agencies demanded answers for their viewership. Uh, parents, of course, demanded answers because, you know, that what is going on in their child's school? Um, um, friends and other loved ones demanded answers just because like, this nobody would have expected this tragedy to happen in this suburban little town outside a major U.S. city. Who would have thought, right? No, this is one of those things that happens in the inner cities or those little podunk redneck towns. No, 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 that doesn't happen here. So, of course, people are angry and they're demanding answers. And they're demanding answers from somebody who doesn't have them yet. <laughs> and so he just he just straight up made shit up. That's, that's what he did. Um, so... I know for a fact that the sheriff's department is responsible for the uh, for the claim that they were victims seeking retribution against their bullies. Paraphrased, uh, the sheriff's department can definitely be blamed for that. As far as the whole goth thing goes, um, that again, like I said, some kids who were associated with the. Uh, trench coat mafia, short-lived clique that had largely been graduated since the year before. Uh, a few of them were goths, so um, now a couple kids had you know had remembered the trench coat mafia, and uh, I don't remember exactly who uh, pointed the finger at the at that point long graduated trench coat mafia kids, but uh, that was. Basically, uh, they, they were bas the the those those students were basically scapegoated for no other reason than Klebold and Harris decided to wear trench coats that day. They had never really worn trench coats to school before that day, and on that day they decided to bust up their routine, do something different. Because why? They wanted to conceal exactly how many guns and ammo they each had on their own persons. So. It wasn't a, 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 an expression of clique affiliation. It was purely utilitarian on their end. And again, like a couple kids who were affiliated with the disbanded trench coat mafia clique were goths. It was not necessarily a goth clique, but you know, it was the nerd geek dork freak clique. So there's there's something else that just like really bothers me because I I have looked I have I have looked through so much actual information about this massacre in preparation for this video, and I, I have concluded that Marilyn Manson is also not innocent of just making shit up. He still to this day likes to point the finger at the Columbine Massacre uh, for his increasingly dismal album sales over the last 20 years when... Um, you know, rather than just admit that his fame was a total flash in the pan that was uh, built off of sensationalism and an already existing media fascination with, um, with, with the darkly inclined and goths and all of that. And I'll get to that in a second. But uh, so uh, Big Brian insists that a reporter who he literally does not name, and nobody else has been able to find out who this reporter allegedly was, who claimed that the uh, that Klebold and Harris uh, showed up to school wearing black and white Marilyn Manson makeup. Like I said, like nobody's been able to find out which reporter said that. Furthermore, this is one of those things that would have that was like pretty much instantly debunked after the uh, security footage from the school uh, uh, that day um, got out to the press later that day, and it showed Klebold and Harris not wearing any makeup to speak of. So, as far as his canceled uh, concert in Florida, I believe the following week or so. He voluntarily canceled that. Nobody demanded he cancel anything. So, the worst thing about Columbine and the uh, 
um, erroneous association with uh, Goths in 1999. I think this basically was everything coming to a head because in the 90s, Goths were pretty much a trash TV staple. We had these trashy little chat shows. Um, the most famous would be Jerry Springer, but also um, we had uh, personalities, uh, Jenny Jones, um, Sally Jesse Raphael. I remember Typo Negative, or at least Peter Steele was on a Sally episode. Uh, I think Donahue had retired earlier in the 90s, but uh, he was he was one of the pioneers of this uh, genre of talk show. So yeah, Maury Povich, I think Povich might still be on in syndication. I know Springer retired a couple years ago. The most famous topics of these shows kind of had like this r rotation of, um, you know, the, the Baby Daddy episodes. And then, of course, we had a list of basically a modern-day sideshow freak show. Um, list of topics, which included things like, you know, 80-year-old woman with a 25-year-old man, um, um, you know, weird relationships. Geraldo was, uh, got really famous for being, uh, punched by a neo-Nazi on one of his episodes. Again, we've got your little modern-day sideshow, uh, topics. And, of course, another popular modern-day sideshow topic for these chat shows was extreme teens, which often included at least one goth or goth-aspiring, I guess, teenager. Though there were a couple episodes, I remember, that was just, like, all goth kids. I remember an episode of Ricky Lake that had, like, five different goth kids on the, uh, the show. High school goths were already kind of a hot topic and a source of media fascination for most of the decade at that point. And a couple years previous, there was a... Uh, it was really famous at the time, though. It seems to have since faded into relative obscurity compared to the Columbine Massacre, uh, the, uh, the whole, like, vampire cult killings. Um, earlier in the decade, the... United States was um, was just starting to get over the uh, the satanic panic, which actually began in the 80s. But I see a lot of people like chalking that up to you know being a 90s thing. I'm like, kinda, in the way that you could say Queen Victoria was a 20th century monarch because she uh, she died. What was it, 1904? So yeah, I mean, <laughs> so. We, we already had this media fascination with goths that had begun earlier in the 90s. And, and like I said, you know, the, the whole satanic panic thing that kind of petered out about midway through the decade. And then there was the, the little vampire cult murders, and which, like I said, was very famous at the time, but was soon greatly eclipsed by the, uh, the erroneous accusations of goths having had anything to do with Columbine. And then, of course, we had the Columbine High Massacre, which had nothing to do with goths. In fact, and, you know, like, while the argument could be made that, um, at least one of the, um, young adults involved in that whole vampire cult killing may have been goths, um, I think their little leader was more into heavy metal music, but, uh, and plus there's the fact that, um, most of the U.S. at the time where, where there were cities that had, uh, that had goth nights, outside of, like, New York City and Los Angeles, there, there was no pure goth night if if you want to use cruder terms like there was no there were very few nights if any outside the big three cities that uh the the three biggest cities that i just named which would be new york city los angeles and chicago so outside of those three cities and even in chicago most uh, of the 
most of the goth knights were goth and industrial knights. So the fact that uh, Eric Harris had KMFDM lyrics up on his uh, on his website, uh, Stray Bullet specifically, and which just kind of suggests he missed the point of that song completely. Uh, <laughs> in fact, I remember uh, KMFDM um, issued a, a press release shortly after, uh, basically disowning him as a fan and, and saying that. Um, uh, that they would never condone such horrific violence in any way, shape, or form. Uh, they were also fans of, uh, of Rammstein and arguably Marilyn Manson, though uh, like they weren't the biggest fans of Marilyn Manson, and Marilyn Manson also disowned them as fans. So, <laughs> so what did all of this mistaken identity do for those of us who yeah. were high school goths in 1999. I've summed it up to people in comments on um, on a Caitlin Doherty's uh, video about this topic, and I uh, I think the best way I could put it is, while at my high school um, things weren't great beforehand, but the uh, the, the like four or five goth kids, which should be myself included. And that, that should really show like how much of a heyday goth was having in the 1990s, because at my tiny little rural high school in Hole in the Wall, Michigan, <laughs> you know, there were, there were a good five goth kids in the nerd geek dork freak clique. So <laughs> there was no only goth in the village at my high school, uh, as much as I sometimes joke about it amongst close friends. So, on April 19th, we were regarded by uh, students and faculty as mostly harmless curiosities. Um, the, the, the greatest extent of, our, of the bullying that, um, that most of us suffered was social ostracization from our classmates and the most scrutiny we tended to endure from teachers and other faculty was the thought we would be a harm to ourselves. You know, they saw all of this, uh, all of this, you know, dark makeup on, um, and the black clothes and these, uh, bands using these, um, fanciful esoteric symbols and surrealist lyrics, and they thought that this was a warning sign. Like, a lot of people forget that the, uh, that, that self-harm was a headline story in a lot of magazines in the early mid 1990s. So I want to say around like 93, 94, um, the whole topic of cutters was first entering mainstream, um, magazine topics. So again, like I said, a lot of um, a lot of the school faculty assumed we were more a risk to ourselves on April nineteenth, and then come April twenty first, the faculty assumes that we are a risk to everyone else in the school. You know, they're no longer concerned for our well being. They even though a, a few of us did have, and, and I'm not just talking the the goths. Um, Amongst, I want to say, amongst um, the, uh, the the nerd geek dork freak clique, which, as I've explained before, is literally the lowest rung on the high school social hierarchy. I was probably considered at my high school lower than that. Like I was the dirt under the ladder, <laughs> and it's because I was from one of those families that is talked about in hushed tones and all of that. Most of this was not having anything to do with me. <laughs> uh, my mother was a later-in-life lesbian. This was fairly well-known. Uh, my father was also a junk man, a rag-and-bone man. A, uh, he, he was a white Fred Sanford, let, as in Sanford and Son, not Red Fox, the stand-up comedian. So uh, he was also a bit more of a low-key hoarder. He had a lot of shit in the yard, like, my mo my stepmother was very grateful for the uh, for for the chicken f fencing at by the, you know shortly after my dad moved in. In fact, I warned my stepmother that if he she married him and we all moved in, he would junk up the yard so fast, which he did. 
And of course, uh, my uh, my younger sister. Like there were there were kids who forgot that I had a younger sister because she was in and out of juvie so much that at some point my younger sister was a county ward who was placed in foster homes. Like she didn't even go to the same high school at, that I did until I had already left. <laughs> So, uh, you know, that was when she finally got to move back in with our parents, and there were, there were kids at my school who kind of forgot that I even had a younger sister because she was a major delinquent. And I was, I was from that trashy-ass family. I, yeah, we were, we were like the, uh, we, we were, we were that family, like, much like, uh, much like the Wilkerson's, a lot of people don't realize that is the canonical surname of the family on Malcolm in the Middle, we, we were very much like that. Except, kind of in reverse, more people found my stepmother to be the likable one, and, you know, the, the long-suffering spouse to my dad being Lois. <laughs> I mean, I was already probably getting the most out of it, even on the 19th of April, and, like I said, unlike, unlike, um, what uh, Angela Benedict had relayed in one of her videos uh, about uh, how at her high school at Long Island, New York, there was the Beat the Freak Week. Uh, we didn't really have that because it was such a small town that that kind of thing would not fly because almost every family was three degrees removed from knowing every other family of, you know, the other students at the high school. When you're like one or two degrees removed, you're not go. You know, if you're if you're being smart about tormenting the 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 low tier classmates at your school, uh, you're like I said. If you're going to be smart about it, you you won't throw the first punch. You will go to them into doing it. So and of course, like I said, like a couple of us, uh, not just. Uh, the, uh, not just the, the, the goth kids, like myself, but the other, a uh, couple of the other nerd geek dork freaks, you know, we, we, uh, the, they, they would single out the most emotionally volatile of us, which included myself. I mean, let's face it, I just told you what my family was like, so, um, and th they would goad us into, you know, either throwing a punch or throwing a book or otherwise... You know, as an adult, in retrospect, I could say uh, that was a foolish thing to do, but when you're a teenager and um, an emotionally volatile teenager who already knows, like, it, it was no secret that I was from that family, that that especially trashy family. The whole world already, already just could not lay off me to... I, I couldn't win for losing to begin with, so... It was it was not difficult to um, to uh, to basically get me in trouble with by just verbal taunts, and so yeah, that is that is that is a that is a serious form that a lot of bullying takes, and it's one that gives a lot of adults what they feel is a valid excuse to literally blame the victim for it. That, oh, well, if you didn't have such a reaction to it, maybe they wouldn't do that. I'm like, well, they shouldn't be doing it to begin with. So, um, but yeah, the 21st, just imagine everything that we were already putting up with, especially us five, the five goths in the village. Imagine what we were already putting up with. And I, I really can't speak too strongly to uh, the experiences of the other four, but just to sort of uh, drive home exactly um, how freaky the nerd geek dork freaks w f were. Um, seriously, um, amongst the other four goths in the village was a friend of mine who was literally one of only two black kids in school out of a school of, I want to say, about a thousand tops for grades uh, 9 through 12. So, and they were not related, and they were so sick of answering questions from, you know, new kids who would, like, move in from another part of the county or the next 
um, rural county over and be like, oh, so are you two like brothers and sisters? Like, no, no, they weren't even related. Um, and remember, I grew up in Metro Detroit, so while it did take me as a white kid a couple weeks to figure out what was so weird about that town, it did hit me. And it hit me like a, like a son of a pup because I, I, would, I just, it, it just all occurred to me. That is what is so weird about this town is like, there, there are almost no black people. Like, I, I seriously thought towns that white only existed on TV and in movies. I, I didn't think it was a thing that existed in real life until my father remarried and moved us in there. And uh, um, like I said, just imagine everything that we were getting and multiply it by at least ten. We suddenly got it so much worse. As I said in one of the... In, uh, in an earlier part of the video, I believe it was the part where I was, like, half-tired and all of that. In fact, I cut out a good chunk of that because I was tired enough I forgot how to math. And, <laughs> and more to the point, I forgot how many years one is typically in high school. And uh, my senior year was only one semester. And the reason it was only one semester is a bit convoluted. Uh, but, oh, yeah, that was another thing that I got the really strong end of the social ostracization shtick um, uh, part of the bullying. And plus, of course, the special taunting was I, uh, I had to repeat eighth grade for medical reasons. Like I, Long story short, I was in hospital for about three months um, for... Uh, medical reasons, and of course, when I get out, I've missed about half the school year, and so the kids I was in seventh and eighth grade, or at least the first year of eighth grade, with like they were they were seniors the year I was a junior in high school. So, um, so uh, so yeah, I've been on my own since I was seventeen, and. While the most significant reason for that has to do with the especially violent nature of the relationship between my father and I, uh, I could have I could have had it a whole lot easier um, as far as um, records and all of that, or even just the cost of rent goes by staying in Lenaway County and finishing high school there, but. Between April 21st and the end of the school year, which was like the first week of June of uh, 1999, I, I had already just had enough. Like, I could have put up with another semester or even a full, you know, final school year. So a full two semesters. Uh, I could have I could have put up with with it for one more year at that high school if it had just stayed like it was from before April 20th of 1999, if it had just stayed only that bad, I could have, I could have finished the school year and, um, graduated with my friends and at the very, at, and I could have at the very least not had to deal with the, headache of enrolling yourself into high school <laughs> because I had to do that for my senior semester at Pioneer High in Ann Arbor but I wanted to get as far away from that town as I could manage with what very little means that I had so I called a friend who had graduated the previous year and he and his girlfriend at the time came and picked me up, and uh, I moved to Ann Arbor. And I got priced out of town not too long afterward, but that's another story for another time. Uh, so, it, it was bad. Like I said, we, we went from being, the, the, the five goth kids at my school, we went from being... Um, regarded as mostly harmless curiosities 
you know, we listened to typo negative and Christian, and that's another thing, it's like, um, suddenly t-shirts that were regarded as completely benign on April 19th, like my Christian death t-shirt, and it is still packed up in one of my big bags of clothes that I pulled up out of my closet for the exterminator, so, uh, that is, that is still put away, but I've had the cr same Christian death t-shirt that I've had since I was 16 years old, so at that point, so by April 21st, I'd already had it almost two years. I'd already had it almost two years. And there there were pictures in the yearbook from the previous year of me wearing this t-shirt. Suddenly, because of that goddamn fan fiction by that, by that by that one girl's mother, suddenly this was against the school dress code. Now, to be fair to to, to one of my friends from the five goths in the village, uh, my, uh, he, I completely give him the benefit of the doubt. He said, uh, so on the 21st, just not even thinking, just grabbing the, the, the top clean t-shirt from his dresser drawer to, uh, get dressed for school, he threw on that infamous KMFDM uh, Don't Blow Your Top t-shirt. Uh, we all know the one I'm talking about. If you don't, go find yourself an image search. So he, he, I completely trust him when he says that he wasn't even thinking until he got into his car. He was one of my two friends who had a car. So I completely believe him when he says that. He wasn't even thinking about it. He just, you know, didn't even realize until he was about almost to school in his car, and he was kind of running late anyway, so he just figured, okay, if somebody has a cow about this when I get into school, I'll just turn it inside out, like, you know, they, they should know me, I just, yeah, they should know me by now to know that all I have to do is just, you know, just ask me to turn it inside out. But that wasn't how it worked out, so what happened was, and like I said, I completely give him the benefit of the doubt of this, I have no reason to disbelieve him, he was, he, he was the exact opposite of your high school edgelord. So, uh, so as I was saying, when, uh, w when he got to school, nobody said anything to him about it until he was in homeroom, so first period, I believe. So yeah, he's in, uh, he's in his homeroom period, and he's, uh, and he's given a call on the PA down to the principal's office, and he has no idea what it was what it was about and they uh and they accuse him of wearing that t-shirt to threaten the entire student body so like i said he he was the exact opposite of your high school edge lord <laughs> your hippie in black clothes who listened to you know switchblade symphony was probably his favorite band at that time uh, he did like KMFDM. Um, he really loved their T-shirts because he really loved that um, that uh, that that Soviet style art that they did on most of their um, artwork. I think he liked the T-shirts more than he liked the band. But uh, and and he says to me like when uh, he's getting these accusations thrown at him, he figures well they've already made up their minds. I might as well just. Um, see if I can make the best out of this, and he, he thought he would go for humor, and, uh, and try to argue that the t-shirt is telling people, no, don't do this, uh, but no, he, uh, he, he got sent home, and, um, um, before, like, barely, like, class had just barely started, and he got sent home, uh, accused of wearing a t-shirt to threaten people, or threaten people by way of t-shirt. So, uh, the, uh, the only friend of mine who had a trench coat, who, which he had had for two years at that point, why it was fairly practical, <laughs> it was fairly practical, and, you know, it, it was, went for the kind of look he was going for, uh, and he didn't even wear it to class, he, it was just, like, his heavy coat. One day it was raining, so he unzipped the lining from it and just put it on, and of course, he got, yeah, uh, he was threatened with in-school suspension for wearing a coat he'd had for two years at that point. Um, 
and the students really weren't any better. Like I said, I, I probably got the worst of it, and, um, I, I definitely got the worst of it. I, like, that, that was suddenly the first time I'd ever gotten, like, a serious physical beatdown in my entire time in high school. And Pioneer High wasn't that much better, all things considered. The, the students were much better at Pioneer. The students were fine. The students at Pioneer were fine. I mean, yeah, I was the new kid, and it got around fairly fast that uh, I'd moved out of my parents' home, and I had to enroll myself into high school. Uh, that kind of thing, especially when there are uh, younger people in the office while you're trying to get all of this done, that kind of thing gets around really fast. So the students were more or less, you know, fine. They were fine. Uh, the faculty, on the other hand, there was this one teacher in particular who would violently jerk her body away from away when I would walk down the hallway, and I didn't even have a class with this woman. Uh, she would just see me walking through the halls to my class, and suddenly just, you know, she's waiting outside the, she's waiting outside her classroom, and I'm walking by, like, not even on the same side of the, of the hallway. She's suddenly just violently jerking her whole body away from me, like, and, and, I don't know. And, uh, at, a. Uh, at the uh, at the first high school though in Podunk, Michigan, the only students who didn't treat us any different were the other nerd geek dork freaks. So, the non goth nerd geek dorks uh, and nerd geek dork freaks they they knew that like no no this had nothing to do with any of you guys. Uh, one of them, the, um, uh, Magdalena was, uh, was one of my, was, was one of my, uh, was one of my, uh, uh, female friends at, um, at high school. She was a big comic book nerd. I, uh, she and I got into comic books so, so hard together sometimes. And, uh, she, uh, she said, you know, I didn't even think these kids were really goths, like, like the, like the, like 2020 is saying and all that. I don't even think that. Like, look at those guys. They just... They they look like a couple of preps who who listen to you know who, who think they're going to be edgy and uh, and I and behold she was right she was right and uh, unfortunately I have lost touch with her over the years but uh, Magdalena if <laughs> if somehow you come across this you you were kind of the <laughs> you were kind of the unsung rock at my <laughs> at that high school. Uh, especially amongst us nerd geek dork freaks, she she was she was kind of the rock. She she was that. Uh, if you've ever seen Matt Groening's Life in Hell comic, um, there's that uh, there's that Childhood is Hell book he did, and um, and one of the com one of the strips in that book was uh, the the sixteen types of sister, and she was she was kind of like the little mom kind of sister of you know the rest of us at that lunch table of the nerd geek dork freaks and yeah she was just she was just so cool but so warm-hearted and nice and sweet and um, always making sure that the rest of us were having you know we're, we're having a good day you know and at the very least you know we could talk to her about shit and um but um but yeah so that's that's about all i've rambled on far longer than i wanted to about this um, and, uh, there is no moral to the story. The moral to the story, if there really has to be one, is that, just get your facts right. That's, that's the moral of the story. Get your facts right before judging others, and, I don't know, when all else fails, look at cat butt. Especially when the cat just decides that you need a cat butt in your face, because, um, well, actually, this one has decided that he is unclean. He must be clean. Mm, his paws are delicious. So, bats and kisses, sweethearts. Take care of yourselves. And slan.